You would have a much better influence if you would talk less and pray more. God is your source of education. Your long speeches on education and the sciences are painful to the angels of God, who are constantly and intensely active in seeking to call the thoughts and affections to heavenly things. Souls are perishing while you neglect to work with your entrusted talents as Christ has given you an example. Souls will be lost under your long, Christless speeches. Your own soul is dwarfed and crippled in the knowledge of Christ. You are losing very much because you are blinded by the spirit and customs of an education which will not save the soul. The youth need your labor. If you were a converted man, daily learning lessons in the school of Christ, then your labors would be a savor of life unto life. Then you could work with patience and love and in the power of God for the souls of youth who are exposed to temptation. Devote a portion of the time you consume in long addresses to personal labor for the youth who need your help. Teach them the claims of God are upon them. Pray with them. There are many who are bound in evil habits with fetters as firm as steel. The poor victims are fascinated with the charms of Satan's allurements and are unable to break away and stand in God-given freedom. They have lost years. Shall they lose the year just entered upon? Will the principal of the school awaken to a sense of his responsibilities and give his mind and heart to the salvation of the students? If not, then let another take his place. Expenses should not run on and on while nothing or next to nothing is done in the very line for which the school was brought into existence. Shall the powers of mind and soul be misapplied? Shall opportunities be lost? Shall a form and routine be gone through day after day with nothing gained? Oh, awake, awake, teachers and pupils, before it is too late. Awake before you hear from pale and agonized lips the terrible wail, the harvest is past, the summer is ended and we are not saved. Are the gifts and talents of every educator improved for the very best good of the pupils? Who is watching for a favorable moment to speak words of kindness and love? Who loves to tell the story of him who so loved the world that he gave his life to redeem lost and perishing sinners? Train the youth, mold the character, educate, Educate, educate for the future immortal life. Pray often. Plead with God to give you a spirit of supplication. Do not feel that your work as teachers is done unless you can lead your scholars to faith in Jesus and love for him. Let the love of Christ pervade your own souls and then you will unconsciously teach it to others. When you, as instructors, commit yourselves unreservedly to Jesus, for him to lead, to guide, to control, you will not fail. Teaching your students to be Christians is the greatest work before you. Go to God. He hears and answers prayer. Put from your questionings, doubts, and unbelief. Let no harshness come into your teaching. Be not too exacting, but cultivate tender sympathy and love. Be cheerful. Do not scold. Do not censure too severely. Be firm. Be broad. Be Christ-like, pitiful, courteous. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I cannot express to you the intense desire of my soul that you should all seek the Lord most earnestly while he may be found. We are in the day of God's preparation. Let nothing be regarded as of sufficient worth to draw your minds from the work of preparing for the great day of judgment. Get ready. Let not cold unbelief hold your souls away from God, but let his love burn on the altar of your hearts. Chapter 28 The Appearance of Evil I feel urged to address those who are engaged in giving the last message of warning to the world. 
whether those for whom they labor see and accept the truth depends very much upon the individual workers. The command from God is, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord, and Paul charges Timothy, Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine. The work must commence with the worker. He must be united to Christ as the branch is united to the vine. I am the vine, said Christ. Ye are the branches. The closest possible connection is here represented. Engraft the leafless twig upon the flourishing vine stalk, and it becomes a living branch, drawing sap and nourishment from the vine. Fiber by fiber, vein by vein, the sapling clings until it buds and blossoms and bears fruit. The sapless twig represents the sinner. When united to Christ, soul is joined to soul, the feeble and finite to the holy and infinite, and man becomes one with Christ. Without me, says Christ, ye can do nothing. Are we who claim to be workers with Christ united to him? Do we abide in Christ? And are we one with him? The message that we bear is worldwide. It must come before all nations, tongues, and peoples. The Lord will not require any of us to go forth with this message without giving us grace and power to present it to the people in a manner corresponding to its importance. The great question with us today is, are we carrying to the world this solemn message of truth in a way to show its importance? The Lord will work with the laborers if they will make Christ their only dependence. He never designed that his missionaries should work without his grace, destitute of his power. Christ has chosen us out of the world that we might be a peculiar and holy people. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. God's workers must be men of prayer, diligent students of the scriptures, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, that they may be a light and strength to others. Our God is a jealous God, and he requires us to worship him in spirit and in truth, in the beauty of holiness. The psalmist says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. As workers, we must take heed to our ways. If the psalmist could not be heard, if he regarded iniquity in his heart, how can the prayers of men now be heard while iniquity is regarded by them? After the passing of the time in 1844, fanaticism came into the ranks of Adventists. God gave messages of warning to stay the incoming evil. There was too great familiarity between some men and women. I presented to them the holy standard of truth that we should reach and the purity of deportment that we should maintain in order to meet the approval of God and be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Most solemn denunciations from God were given to men and women whose thoughts were running in an impure channel while they claimed to be especially favored by God. But the message which God gave was despised and rejected. They turned upon me and said, Has God spoken only by you and not by us? They did not amend their ways, and the Lord suffered them to go on till defilement marked their lives. We are not out of danger even now. Every soul who engages to give to the world the message of warning will be sorely tempted to pursue such a course in life as will deny his faith. It is Satan's studied plan to make the workers weak in prayer, weak in power, and weak in influence because of their defects of character. We as workers must be united in frowning down and condemning everything that bears the least approach to evil in our associations with one another. Our faith is holy. Our work is to vindicate the honor of God's law. And it is not of a character to bring anyone down to a low level in thought or in deportment. There is an exalted platform for us to stand upon. We must believe and teach the truth as it is in Jesus. 
Holiness of heart will never lead to impure actions. When one who claims to be teaching the truth is inclined to be much in the company of young or even married women, when he familiarly lays his hand upon them or is often conversing with them in a familiar manner, be afraid of him. The pure principles of truth are not inwrought in his soul. Such are not in Christ, and Christ is not abiding in them. They need a thorough conversion before God can accept their labors. The truth of heavenly origin never degrades the receiver, never leads him to the least approach of undue familiarity. On the contrary, it sanctifies the believer, refines his taste, elevates and ennobles him, and brings him into a close connection with Jesus. It leads him to regard the Apostle Paul's injunction to abstain from even the appearance of evil, lest his good be evil spoken of. There is a subject to which we must give heed. We must guard against the sins of this degenerate age. We must stand aloof from everything that savors of undue familiarity. God condemns it. It is forbidden ground upon which it is unsafe to set the feet. Every word and action should tend to elevate, refine, and ennoble the character. There is sin and thoughtlessness about such matters. The Apostle Paul exhorted Timothy to diligence and thoroughness in his ministry and urged him to meditate upon those things that were pure and excellent, that his profiting might appear unto all. The same counsel is greatly needed by young men of the present age. Thoughtful consideration is essential. If men would only think more and act less impulsively, they would meet with much greater success in their labors. We are handling subjects of infinite importance, and we cannot afford to weave into our work our own defects of character. We want to represent the character of Christ. We have a work to do to elevate men and win them to Christ, to lead them to choose and earnestly seek to be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Every thought, every word, Every action of the workers should be of that elevated character which is in harmony with the sacred truth they advocate. It may be that men and women will necessarily be united more or less in our important mission fields. If this is the case, they cannot be too circumspect. Let married men be reserved and guarded that no evil may truthfully be said of them. We are living in an age when iniquity abounds and an unguarded word or improper action may greatly injure the usefulness of the one who shows this weakness. Let the workers keep up the barriers of reserve. Let not one instant occur of which the enemy can make capital. If they begin to place their affections upon one another, giving special attention to favorites and using flattering words, God will withdraw his spirit. If married men go into the work, leaving their wives to care for the children at home, the wife and mother is doing fully as great and important a work as the husband and father. Although one is in the missionary field, the other is a home missionary, whose cares and anxieties and burdens frequently far exceed those of the husband and father. Her work is a solemn and important one to mold the minds and fashion the characters of her children, to train them for usefulness here and fit them for the future immortal life. The husband in the open missionary field may receive the honors of men, while the home toiler may receive no earthly credit for her labor. But if she works for the best interest of her family, seeking to fashion their characters after the divine model, the recording angel writes her name as one of the greatest missionaries in the world. God does not see things as man's finite vision views them. How careful should the husband and father be to maintain his loyalty to his marriage vows? How circumspect should be his character lest he shall encourage thoughts in young girls or even in married women that are not in accordance with the high holy standard, the commandments of God? Those commandments Christ shows to be exceedingly broad, reaching even the thoughts, intents, and purposes of the heart. 
Here is where many are delinquent. Their heart imaginings are not of the pure, holy character which God requires. And however high their calling, however talented they may be, God will mark iniquity against them and will count them as far more guilty and deserving of his wrath than those who have less talent, less light, less influence. I am pained when I see men praised, flattered, and petted. God has revealed to me the fact that some who receive these attentions are unworthy to take his name upon their lips. Yet they are exalted to heaven in the estimation of finite beings who read only from outward appearance. My sisters, never pet and flatter poor, fallible, erring men, either young or old, married or unmarried. You know not their weaknesses, and you know not but that these very attentions and this profuse praise may prove their ruin. I am alarmed at the short-sightedness, the want of wisdom that many manifest in this respect. Men who are doing God's work and who have Christ abiding in their hearts will not lower the standard of morality, but will ever seek to elevate it. They will not find pleasure in the flattery of women or in being petted by them. Let men, both single and married, say, Hands off! I will never give the least occasion that my good shall be evil spoken of. My good name is capital of far more value to me than gold or silver. Let me preserve it untarnished. If men assail that name, it shall not be because I have given them occasion to do so, but for the same reason that they spoke evil of Christ, because they hated the purity and holiness of his character, for it was a constant rebuke to them. I wish I could impress upon every worker in God's cause the great need of continual earnest prayer. They cannot be constantly upon their knees, but they can be uplifting their hearts to God. This is the way that Enoch walked with God. Be careful lest self-sufficiency come in and you drop Jesus out and work in your own strength rather than in the spirit and strength of the Master. Do not waste golden moments in frivolous conversation. When you return from doing missionary work, do not praise yourself, but exalt Jesus. Lift up the cross of Calvary. Allow no one to praise or flatter you or to cling to your hand as if loath to let it go. Be afraid of every such demonstration. When young or even married persons show a disposition to open their family secrets to you, beware. When they express a desire for sympathy, know that it is time to exercise great caution. Those who are imbued with the Spirit of Christ and who are walking with God will have no unholy pining for sympathy. They have a companionship that satisfies every desire of the mind and heart. Married men who accept the attention, the praise, and petting of women should be assured that the love and sympathy of this class are not worth the obtaining. Women are too often tempters. On one pretense or another, they engage the attention of men, married or unmarried, and lead them on till they transgress the law of God, till their usefulness is ruined and their souls are in jeopardy. The history of Joseph is left on record for the benefit of all who, like him, are tempted. In principle, he was firm as a rock, and he answered the tempter, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Moral power like his is what is needed now. If women would only elevate their lives and become workers with Christ, there would be less danger through their influence. But with their present feelings of unconcern in regard to home responsibilities and in regard to the claims that God has upon them, their influence is often strong in the wrong direction. Their powers are dwarfed, and their work does not bear the divine impress. They are not home missionaries, neither are they missionaries away from home. And frequently, home, precious home, is left to desolation. Let everyone who professes Christ seek to overcome all unmanliness, all weakness and folly. 
Some men never grow up to the full stature of men in Christ Jesus. They are childish and self-indulgent. Humble piety would correct all this. Pure religion possesses no characteristics of childish self-indulgence. It is honorable in the highest degree. Then let not one of those who have enlisted as soldiers of Christ be ready to faint in the day of trial. All should feel that they have earnest work to do to elevate their fellow men. Not one has a right to rest from the warfare to make virtue desirable and vice hated. There is no rest for the living Christian this side of the eternal world. To obey God's commandments is to do right and only right. This is Christian manliness. But many need to take frequent lessons from the life of Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You are to show a growth in the Christian graces by manifesting meekness under provocation and growing away from low earthliness you give evidence that you have an indwelling Savior, and every thought, word, and deed attracts men to Jesus rather than to self. There is a great amount of work to be done and but little time in which to do it. Let it be your life work to inspire all with the thought that they have a work to do for Christ. Wherever there are duties to be done which others do not understand because they do not wish to see their life work, accept them and do them. The standard of morality is not exalted high enough among God's people. Many who profess to be keeping God's commandments and standing in their defense are breaking them. Temptations present themselves in such a way that the tempted think they see an excuse to transgress. Those who enter the missionary field should be men and women who walk and talk with God. Those who stand as ministers in the sacred desk should be men of blameless reputation. Their lives should be spotless above everything that savors of impurity. Do not place your reputation in jeopardy by going in the way of temptation. If a woman lingeringly holds your hand, quickly withdraw it and save her from sin. If she manifests undue affection and mourns that her husband does not love her and sympathize with her, do not try to supply this lack. Your only safe and wise course in such a case is to keep your sympathy to yourself. Such cases are numerous. Point such souls to the burden-bearer, the true and safe counselor. If she has chosen Christ as a companion, he will give her grace to bear neglect without repining. Meanwhile, she should diligently do all in her power to bind her husband to herself by strictest fidelity to him and faithfulness in making his home cheerful and attractive. If all her efforts are unavailing and unappreciated, she will have the sympathy and aid of her blessed Redeemer. He will help her to bear all her burdens and comfort her in her disappointments. She shows distrust of Jesus when she reaches for human objects to supply the place that Christ is ever ready to fill. In her repining, she sins against God. She would do well to examine her own heart critically to see if sin is not lurking in the soul. The heart that thus seeks human sympathy and accepts forbidden attentions from anyone is not pure and faultless before God. The Bible affords many striking illustrations of the strong influence of evil-minded women. When Balaam was called upon to curse Israel, he was not permitted to do so. For the Lord hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. But Balaam, who had already yielded to temptation, now became fully the agent of Satan and he determined to accomplish indirectly what God had not permitted him to do directly.